All right, let's take a look at some moving fluid problem solving tips. So when you look at a fluid problem, you first want to check and see if it's static or if it's moving. If it's moving, that means you can apply our ideas of continuity and our ideas of Bernoulli to our problem. And actually, I want to talk about continuity really fast. So our continuity equation says that the area times the velocity is a constant when we have a liquid moving through a tube or a container or something like that. That is supposed to be a V. So that's one way that the continuity comes up. Remember this thing here, this area times V is what we call the volume, the flow rate. So that's the way we, we kind of modified it to fit into this equation because it's most useful that way. But the flow rate shows up a couple of different ways. So by definition, the flow rate is the amount of volume that goes past a point or that flows per time. So it's a delta volume over delta time. So sometimes in a problem, you might be given the volume and the time. It might say, hey, three cubic meters of a fluid um, flow into a tank in 30 seconds. So you'd have your three cubic meters over your 30 seconds, and you get a flow rate of 0.1 cubic meters per second, I think. Um, so that's fine. Sometimes you're given that. Sometimes you're given the speed of the fluid, the velocity of the fluid, and the size of the tube. And you can use the velocity of the fluid and the size of the tube, and you can also find the flow rate that way. One other way that might come up sometimes is they might give you a mass flow rate. They might say, oh, well, the amount of mass of your liquid over a given amount of time is so many kilometers per second or something like that. And if you think back to our ideas of density, that density is, remember, mass per volume. And then we can say that volume is really mass per density if we just kind of switch the corners there. So we can say that another way of finding the volumetric flow rate is really this mass flow rate divide this whole mass flow rate divided by the density of your liquid. So there are three ways to get the volumetric flow rate that you may be given in a problem. So just be careful. You don't always need the A times V. You might be given other ways. And then if you're given the mass flow rate or the volume flow rate this way, you can get the A times V or the what that actually equals using those. Just be careful about that because a lot of times you uh, it's a little bit tricky to find out where to see them in the problem. Uh, so you know, the velocity only depends on the area, doesn't depend on the pressure, doesn't depend on the height, purely on the area. So if you need the velocity and you have a velocity somewhere else and the size of your tube, if it's changing, you can always find the other velocity. Uh, also check if both points in your problem, usually these problems have like a, a point A and a point B that you're trying to determine how they're different from each other. If they're both open to the same atmosphere, then they're going to have the same pressures because the pressure is forced to be whatever it is the, whatever it's the atmosphere it's open to. Now, if they're if they're not open to the atmosphere, you can't do that. But if they are open to the same atmosphere, that pressure term is going to cancel out. Remember, you always get to set one height equal to zero because you're you you set whatever the height what the heights are based on. So it's usually helpful to make one height in your problem zero and then base the other height on that first height. It just makes life a little bit easier. Gives you one less term to worry about. And also for these questions, assumptions are super, super important. A lot of times, almost every problem, you can make some assumptions that cancel out terms that just make, just make your math life at the end a little bit easier. And when you're done, you can, it's always good to check your answers in these cases. Remember, if you have a small area tube, if the area gets smaller, usually your velocity is going to go up. So you can check that and make sure it goes up, make sure you didn't make a mistake. Areas that have high velocities usually have low pressures as well. And also watch your units. Remember, you want your... You want your density units to be in kilograms per cubic meter. You want your pressure units to be in pascals, which are newtons per square meter. A lot of times they're given in kilopascals, so just be careful about that. Remember, because if you want to do any math with them, you're going to have to cancel terms out and you need them to be in pascals or newtons per square meter. You want your heights usually to be in meters. So just check your units and make sure they match up. So that when you do do some math at the end, it's going to cancel. They're going to cancel out correctly. So let's look at a couple of these cases and see how we can apply these ideas to different questions. So here's one. It says, a tank is filled as shown. There's a small hole punched in it right there. Now this is also, I'm, I'm looking at this picture. I'm noticing, hey, this is open. The atmosphere, the hole here is open. So that's already triggering something in my mind. Um, a small hole, we'll get back to what small hole is going to mean something to. I'm punching it D above the table. How fast will a stream of water come out? So coming out is here. So we want to know velocity there. Come out of the hole. And then it's asking us if the water level is drops to H over two. So it's only that high. 
what happens to how far this water level goes. So this what happens at distance x. Okay, great. So I can kind of see this is going to be a problem where fluids fl um, flowing out, levels are going to change. This is a moving fluid problem. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of label two points. Let's call this point um, one up here and point two where the hole comes out. And then I'm going to use those and I'm going to apply my different terms to this and uh, see how I do. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to, I know I need two velocities. So I'm going to use the continuity equation. So I'm going to throw that in there. That the area at the top or point one times the velocity at the top of the tank. That's the, the kind of big area of the tank is equal to the area of the hole times the velocity of the liquid coming out of the hole. So I know I can apply that. I'm also then going to apply when you release equation. Sorry about that. My thing popped up in the wrong spot. So I can apply Bernoulli's equation. Um, again, just taking Bernoulli's equation and setting it for point one and for point two. And now I'm going to look and see if I can make any assumptions. So one assumption I saw from the question was that it said it was a small hole. Now a small hole means that the area of the hole or the area of point two is very small compared to the area at the top of the tank. And again, they might give you areas. Now, if this is about I don't know, anything uh, smaller than a one to 10 ratio, you're probably okay to make this assumption. So if the areas are very small, that means if I look up here, if area one is big compared to area two, that means velocity two is gonna be big compared to velocity one. Or I can say that velocity one is really small compared to velocity two. And again, if that ratio is about more than around 10 to one or more, I can actually say, and it's not going to mess up my problem too much. I'm going to make the assumption that velocity one is, is equal to zero. That's then what this really means is that, that, that tank, the water level of the tank is lowering so slow that for all purposes of my problem, I'm going to assume that it's so small that it's basically equal to zero, at least compared to the other velocities. So that's my first assumption. That's going to be nice because let's call this assumption a assumption a means that my term here for the top of the tank goes to zero. Um, let's pick H equals some, zero somewhere. Well, I'm going to pick H equals zero where the hole is, where it comes out. So that's at Y2. So I'm going to say Y2 equals zero. And that means Y1 is going to equal what they called, uh, I think they called it H in the problem. So this term is going to go away. And this just becomes H. And also, we, I had mentioned that both of the, the top of the tank, it's an open tank, and the hole is also open to the air. Both of those points are open to the air, one and two. So the pressure at one and the pressure at two are the same. So I can say the pressure at one equals the pressure at two equals some known pressure. So if they're both the same, I can subtract one from each side and then they just go away. So these also cancel each other out because of my um, assumption C. And now my equation up here, really all that's left is this term and this term. Everything else I got rid of. And because I made this assumption, the small hole assumption, I don't actually need continuity here. My small hole assumption takes care of my continuity equation. Now, if I couldn't make that assumption, I could still use the continuity equation. And it gets a little bit tricky. I could say something, for example, that, um, I don't know, the velocity at the top equals the viable size by area two. So I could say something like that. And then I could, if I couldn't cancel out this term here, I could do this with continuity and substitute this into here and then go through and solve this. It gets rid of it. still gets rid of a variable that way, but now my equation is a little bit ugly looking. I have to kind of, it's not horrible. I can still combine terms and it's fine. But if I can make that assumption, as you can see, this term here becomes small. This becomes small. I can just get rid of it. All right, now I got my equation, so let's solve it. So I'm going to start by saying that uh, what's left over. So density times G. So let's see, y1 was h, that equals the 1 half, the density times the velocity at point 2 squared. This is some straightforward uh, math now. Let's see, I got density on both sides, so I can get rid of that. And I get that velocity squared at point 2 is equal to uh, 2gh. So therefore, the velocity at point 2 is just a square root of 2gh. So that whole big nasty equation turns into something really nice and simple here. And you also might remember from last year that this is the same result as free fall. That if I drop a ball and I want to know how fast it's going after it falls a distance h, that's the solution to that problem. 
And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because if you think about what's happening here, you really have, this is telling you, remember, we, this came from conservation of energy. So it's saying you're like dropping like a little fluid molecule that falls down a certain height and how fast is it going when it gets to the ground. It's really the same idea as free fall. So we do get the same solution. Now again, this is assuming a bunch of other things are constant though. Great, so that's not too bad, pretty straightforward. Now the second question it says, um, what happens if the water level is only half? Or it's only half the distance above, so it's H over two above as opposed to H. Now we could go through and solve, and also it says what happens to the distance it goes. So I'm gonna go back here for a second, just so I have more room. Let's solve for how far it goes. Now, if we look, remember back, I'm not gonna do all projectile stuff, but the time it takes to fall distance D, so D ends up being equal to one half AT squared. So the time to fall is going to be two D over, and acceleration is G. So that's the time it takes to fall, which is not, that's the, since D is not changing, this is not changing at all. So I know that's gonna be constant for the for case A and case B. And then the distance X that it travels equals the speed that it's going. So it would be V2 times this time. So really I know that X is proportional to V2. So again, I don't need to solve the solve the whole projectile equation for it, but if, I just gotta remember this piece that X is proportional to V2 because everything else is staying the same. So if I start with that idea that the distance X that travels is proportional to the velocity at point two, really what I gotta figure out is what's happening to the velocity at point two. Well, I, I kinda know that. I know the velocity at point two is the square root of two times G times H. And what's happening to H? Well, H is really going to becoming H over two. So I'll say like H, um, I don't know, H2 in this case, whatever you want to call it. H2, our new H, is really half of what it was before. And well, if velocity is equal to square root of 2GH, and H goes to H over 2, I can kind of see, I mean, it's. I think it's okay, it's kind of okay to see, if this becomes H over 2, this is going to become, now, now we got to be careful, this is underneath a radical our new square root sign. So my new velocity, my velocity in our new case, I'll put a little velocity prime or something like that, is gonna become whatever it was before divided by the square root of two. Since this gets divided by square root of two, or this gets divided by two, this is under a radical, my velocity gets divided by a square root of two, which is about, so now one over square root of two is about 0.7. So my velocity becomes 0.7 of what it was before. So now I can look at my different choices. Well, let's see. And I know that my velocity is 0.7 of what it was before. So I know that the distance traveled is going to be about 0.7 of what it was before. Whatever, the, the original X, whatever you want to call it. Um, so let's look at my choices. So if choice one, well, I already, I already know that this is, it's going to not go as far. The distance it's going to hit when it gets to the ground is going to be less than it was before. So automatically the first two terms are gone. First term says it's bigger than twice what it was before. The second one said it's somewhere between what it was before and twice what it was before. They're both bigger than the original case. First two terms are definitely gone. Now, if I look at these terms, well, this is 0.7. This is saying the distance, the new distance it traveled is between the distance it traveled before or one and half of what it traveled before. Well, that seems to be true because I'm at 0.7 what it traveled before. So this one's looking good. Let's just check and make sure the other one is bad, that there's not like a two answer thing. This one says the new distance traveled when it gets to the ground or the horizontal distance travel is less than half of what it was before. Well, I know it's 0.7, that's more than half. So this one is no good either. So this has to be my answer. So again, a lot of times using continuity, using Bernoulli, using some of your assumptions, you can solve some the math problems pretty easily, but also when they ask you these kind of what happens to the size of something, you don't need to resolve the entire problem. All you need to do is kind of look at what changes, see how it affects what your affects your model and you can usually can't cross out answers or cancel out cases and be left with only one thing that makes any sense at all.